really assemble what we think is uh, an all-star uh, panel and some outstanding uh, keynote speakers. Uh, today's uh, panels are going to be moderated by someone who's uh, very special, who is uh, Karen Goraleski, who's the executive director of the American Society of Tropical Medicine. We're going to try to avoid long biographies because if we, and, and introductions, because if we do that, then it's going to really slow us down. So we have a nice program where you can look at the biographies in the program, and I'll ask you to, uh, to refer to those. So what I'd like to do uh, right away is to move into our program and introduce uh, a, a, a person who really is, is well equipped to, to give us our keynote. He's someone who's uh, worked uh, all over the world. And then again, I like what we're trying to do here is taking that global health lens and turned it inward on, uh, on uh, South Texas. Uh, his name is Joseph McCormick and he's a vice president for South Texas programs uh, for the University of Texas Health Science Center and he's the regional dean of the public health school uh, at their Brownsville campus. And so Joe, with that, I'd like to ask you to come up and, and talk to us. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Peter. It's. Uh, a real pleasure to be able to uh, join you for this uh, for this symposium and to talk about something which is, uh, as Peter suggested, I've spent much of my life doing, including our current work down in, in Brownsville. Um, I want to thank uh, Research America as well and all of the uh, the organizations that have put this together and supported it. Um, how many people here live on two dollars a day? Probably not too many. And yet, as Peter has already pointed out, much, many of the diseases that we are going to be talking about today um, affect those that are among the poorest, those who live on one or two dollars a day. So I, I want to argue that global health is in fact, yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. Global health is, is not just about diseases. It's about human beings. It's about people. It's about providing an opportunity for every one of those children you saw in those pictures to live beyond the age of five years, to get educated, and to be able to, um, to, be able to fulfill their life expectations. Currently, we have about a third of the population of the planet who who have great difficulty in doing that. And that's to me what global health is about. So whether it's about uh, the neglected tropical diseases or HIV or tuberculosis, or as you will see in one of the panels, the emerging problems of chronic disease and how it's affecting people's lives, including children because of the, of the poverty that it can put people in and the difficulty in, uh, in raising their children. So there are many, many aspects of global health that should engage all of us because uh, they affect us uh, economically, they affect us politically, and they should affect us um, emotionally because they are perhaps the remaining, one of the remaining um, problems and issues of trying to make our entire globe a civilized and peaceful globe. We've made progress. And I would invite you to look at, uh, at Hans Rosling's uh, um, presentations on Gapminder. For those of you who, uh, who don't, do not know about uh, Rosling's work, he can show you where we've made, in, in many instances, tremendous progress. Um, but we still have a long way to go. I'm going to give you today 50 years of my own perspective uh, on diseases, some of which are even obscure, not only neglected, but obscure because we don't even know exactly what the burden of disease is, though we know it's pretty large. But I also want to show you that many of the diseases, including HIV, um, in fact were neglected for quite a while until, and I think this is par probably part of the whole effort of looking here in Texas and in our own backyard, until it hit us. <laughs> 
speaking obviously of HIV, and I'll describe to you the first investigation in Africa of HIV and tell you a little bit about the response that was given uh, by our uh, political leaders at that time. I think what we all have to do is to, is to be vigilant, persistent, don't let politics, wars, prejudice, fear, and other things uh, deter us from working in continuing to work toward uh, global justice and um, an improvement in the lives of people that we uh, know are out there who need, um, who need all of the help they can get. And it's very interesting when I use these words. Tomorrow, uh, Sue and I will get on an airplane to go to Karachi. And uh, we have a program there. We, we spent four years in Pakistan uh, back in the 90s building a program uh, there. We continue to work with some of our students in a new program. And I was struck by the obstruction by my own university in getting to Pakistan. We had to sign our life away. Because, not because somebody was that concerned about whether we were going to get kidnapped or whatever, about liability. And this is what I mean about persistence and vigilance and not letting all of these kinds of obstructions get in our way, doing what is what we should be doing, and that is working and continuing to build programs in, uh, in far reaches uh, of the, the part of the world that need uh, all of the partnerships that we can provide. So as Peter said, um, we're now down in South Texas trying to uh, understand the problems and issues of South Texas. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about 50 years of observation. Um, in, uh, I'll be talking about uh, loss of fever, about Congo Crimean, which some of you may not even know about, hantavirus, meningitis in Brazil, which has a lot of implications, um, Ebola in the Congo, HIV in the Congo. But I'll start with this famous quote, which uh, uh, I think now is probably pretty well ensconced in the lore of infectious disease. When the uh, Surgeon General said in 1967 the war against infectious disease had been won. So perhaps if you were living in Washington, that might have been the case. But if you were living in many other parts of the world, you would have thought the guy was mad. So my story starts in uh, 1967, that same year that, uh, that the Surgeon General made his comment. Um, I was a school teacher. I'd finished my undergraduate degree um, and uh, went out to the Congo uh, and spent some time learning French, went out to Congo to teach school, science and math in high school. And this is the area where I was, where that red dot is in the middle of the, uh, um, in the middle of the, uh, there. And then later I went down to teach uh, school in another high school down below. And uh, I taught uh, local students who came mostly from villages where there was no electricity, no running water, and uh, they came and they lived on the campus there, often in, in rooms that, would, uh, that were perhaps 12 by 12 feet, and we would have 12 or 15 students uh, living in that room. But they were desperate for an education. They knew this was their opportunity. I have to say a word about Texas as a, uh, as a, as a site of tropical disease because Many of you, but perhaps not all of you, will know that yellow fever um, has uh, part of its roots in the United States in Texas. And uh, it was, in fact, in Brownsville at Fort Brown where, uh, where uh, uh, Dr. Gorgas um, first had his encounter with yellow fever. And he had that encounter by getting yellow fever and almost dying from it. And uh, as a young uh, physician lieutenant in the, uh, at the fort in Fort Brown, and you see now that uh, University of Texas Brownsville, where we sit on their campus, uh, is uh, in fact uh, you, continues to utilize part of the buildings that were built now 100 and, over 150 years ago. So let's move to Brazil, 1974 and 1975. Uh, Brazil, at São Paulo, is a huge city. Um, and in 1974 and 1975, there was an enormous outbreak of meningococcal meningitis, perhaps one of the largest, if not the largest, outbreak in history. Um, we think there were well over 100,000 cases uh, throughout the country. Um, 
the Emilio Rivas Hospital that you see the picture of here, um, that you see the picture of here on the right, is a 500-bed hospital. And at one point, uh, as I walked through the hospital, there were over 1,000 patients with uh, severe meningococcal disease in the hospital as the country was desperately trying to uh, address this, this issue that was causing uh, panic and, uh, and disruption throughout the country, not just Sao Paulo, but throughout the country. At one point, I stood on the steps of the Emilio Rebus Hospital uh, and over half an hour counted 11 ambulances coming in uh, with suspected cases of meningococcal disease. So it really stressed the, uh, the uh, resources of the Brazilian government at that time. Um, the, the Emilio Rebus Hospital was only one of many that was filled with patients that looked like these. And uh, what it generated was the first opportunity for testing the vaccine, which had been invented in the U.S. military um, by, by uh, Mal Artenstein in the U.S. military uh, because of outbreaks in the military. And uh, the Marieu Company in, in Lyon, France, uh, began to make the vaccine, and uh, to cut a long story short, 80 million doses of the vaccine were given throughout Brazil. Uh, I had the, uh, the opportunity to work with the Brazilians over two years with this program. And uh, what we learned was that, uh, first of all, there were huge disabilities, amputations, uh, neurologic deficits. So this is a devastating disease. It is a very, very bad disease. But ANC polysaccharide vaccines were effective in controlling the epidemic, um, and that was the first really big opportunity we had to, uh, to learn about that. We wrote a paper at that time from, uh, from the CDC recommending, uh, no longer recommending that people be put under surveillance, but actually be treated if they were direct contacts of, of, of people with meningococcal disease. And that remains today, uh, after almost 30 years, the, the um, uh, the practice and the policy for, uh, for addressing contacts of people with meningococcal disease. We also, in the process of this, there were millions of, well, hundreds of thousands of women who were vaccinated while they were pregnant, and there had been a restriction in the vaccine of vaccinating pregnant women because of the concern for, um, for children um, not being able to then respond uh, to a vaccine uh, after their birth. And uh, we showed that that was not the case, and so today that vaccine is used in pregnant women uh, as well as others. What didn't happen at that time was a vaccine being made available to the other millions of people throughout much of the world, particularly in the, vac in the meningitis belt. You see the white uh, meningitis belt across North Africa. So what didn't happen was the uh, development and application of a vaccine um, in that part of the world. And it wasn't until in 2010, finally, when the Gates Foundation and others stepped in that a vaccine, uh, combined ANC uh, conjugated vaccine was developed and is now slowly but surely being applied. So here was a disease that was known to kill somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people at least, and we had very poor surveillance in Northern North Africa. And yet for a very, very long time, it was neglected even when we had a vaccine. Why was it neglected? Because the people in the, in the meningitis belt couldn't pay for the vaccine. And I know that because I sat on the panel at the time of Aventus. Uh, I remember very well meetings where, uh, in fact, the UK was adopting the C conjugate vaccine for their children. And the question was asked about, well, what about applying this and uh, making an A and C vaccine for North Africa where you have this problem? And, uh, the response was, well, they can't pay for it. So I think this is uh, one of the first messages I want to deliver is that uh, it takes an awful lot, and it's now taken the Gates Foundation to step in to make this kind of thing happen. So now let's move to loss of fever in Sierra Leone. In 1969, two years after that famous quote by the, uh, uh, by the Surgeon General, um, the uh, 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 the Andromeda strain emerged. You can look at uh, New York Times and all sorts of newspaper headlines during that period of time describing uh, loss of fever as the new Andromeda strain. It came out of, uh, actually the, the, the initial observation in the U.S. came out of 
uh, out of Nigeria when a, uh, when a Nigerian missionary ended up in New York. But actually the first description was in 1954, published in The Lancet by John Rose working in a missionary hospital in eastern Sierra Leone where we ended up setting up a long-term program. Uh, this is also the diamond mining area, as you will see. So in 1969, uh, we actually got the disease that, were, that uh, came to the U.S. itself. And that, I think, uh, that and the fact that it occurred in many missionaries in Nigeria probably woke people up to maybe this is, there's something to this. And it ended up because the fact that Jordi Casals at Yale got infected from the material from this, the nurse who came over and was in Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, he became infected, one of his, uh, one of, uh, 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 Juan Roman, his lab technician fell ill and died. This got people's attention. Before that, I can assure you, because the, we later showed, uh, we and others showed uh, how prevalent this disease is, nobody was paying any attention. Um, and it wasn't until, again, it hit our shores that, um, that uh, people started to wake up and say, wow. So now you have uh, diamond mining. You know all about that. How many people have seen the Blood Diamond, the film Blood Diamond? Uh, it was real, folks. It was one of the, having uh, spent many years in Sierra Leone, I can tell you it was real. This is, these are pictures of the area in eastern Sierra Leone where we actually set up our, uh, our program in 19, uh, 76 for loss of fever and it went through until the war hit in, 19, in the early 1990s. This was our first laboratory which had no water, no running water, no electricity. We had to supply that. Uh, we had to train local people to be able to work with us. We had to set up surveillance at the hospitals to try to understand the disease um, and try to study it. We, we knew very little about it. We knew that it was this terrible killer, but we didn't know very much about what it actually did in the villages and, the, and surrounding areas, uh, how many people didn't get hospitalized but in fact got infected. What we learned in short was that there were cases coming to the hospitals where we set up our surveillance uh, all year round and uh, that it was in fact, uh, what the, it, it, it produced 27 percent of the medical admissions for the, uh, for the hospital, amazingly. So it was very, very highly endemic with lots of infections both th that got admitted to the hospital, about 16% died, and, uh, but many more infections in the villages as we set up surveillance ar around the area. We looked at uh, prevalence of infection throughout uh, many areas of West Africa, and you see the ranges here that we saw anywhere from 5% all the way up to a quarter of the populations. And, and we had some pretty good size uh, samples from these populations. Um, we also showed that this is probably the most common cause of acute onset deafness of almost any, if not any, disease on the planet. About 20, 20, over 25 percent of people end up with uh, acute deafness from this disease, many of whom do not recover their hearing. And this is an example, a, a nurse in Nigeria that we, uh, when we were doing investigation there, who was completely deaf. She survived the disease, but was completely deaf. So what did we learn? Well, first of all, there is a big burden of disease because loss of fever covers about an area of the, a population of about 200 million people. Um, we have estimated, but we, it, this, is a, this is an estimate based on our prevalence and on our own experience in some, in some, with surveillance, about 200,000 infections per year somewhere between 10 and 20,000 deaths. I promise you if we had anything close to that in the United States, there would be a lot of attention being paid to this disease. Transmitted persistently by, by mastomies, natalensis, a common rodent, uh, but it also is transmissible from person to person. It affects all, the, all ages. It can be prevented by, prevented by rodent reduction, but that's a very tough call in this part of the world. Uh, it causes 100% fetal mortality. Um, and as I mentioned, it causes uh, a high frequency of deafness. It can be treated, as we showed with ribavirin, if treated early, but I can assure you in most uh, instances people don't have the diagnostic capability um, and often don't really know that much about the disease because it's been very difficult to disseminate it. What's perhaps more discouraging is that we've had a candidate vaccine now around for over 20 years that clearly works. In, uh, in primate models. Um, there are a number of other uh, uh, 
combinations of this vaccine, this original vaccine that had been made, none ha are in clinical trials, none are even in production for doing any clinical trials. And that's, again, because there's no money in it. Sierra Leone since then has, uh, has as many of you know, uh, descended into a terrible war. Uh, the last time that Sue and I were there in the late 90s, um, we were up on the border of Liberia and Sierra Leone trying to set up some treatment areas, some diagnostics in uh, some villages that were very heavily affected by it, particularly by all of the migration that was occurring because of the war. We ended up uh, getting invaded by uh, a local rebel group and getting evacuated in this helicopter you see. Uh, it was a, a Russian helicopter that happened to be in Monrovia and could come up and get us and many other aid workers that were working in the area. So that's kind of where things uh, have, uh, and it's an illustration of not only the, the problems of money, but the problems of politics and war and all the other things. So uh, I'm glad to say that NIH has put a new laboratory into uh, Sierra Leone, and there's now new funding going into both Sierra Leone and Nigeria for uh, more work on loss of fever. I'll say a word about Ebola virus uh, because uh, when I was in uh, Sierra Leone in 1976, I got this urgent message. By, in those days, it was by telex, uh, not by email, not by, but telex that was brought up because we had no phones in where we were in Sierra Leone, brought up by road from our embassy in, uh, in Freetown in the, in the capital. Uh, telling us about a big outbreak going on in, uh, in, uh, in the Congo. And so I had to spend four days trying to figure out how to get from, from here to here uh, to help with the uh, investigation in the Congo. In 1967, the same year of the famous uh, Surgeon General's remarks, um, green monkey disease occurred, Marburg, Germany. And this was, uh, there were 31 cases and seven deaths. And uh, these were uh, people who got infected from monkeys that were brought from Uganda uh, for harvesting their, re their kidneys for making tissue culture for working on polio virus. Um, and these monkeys carried some presents that were some gifts that were not anticipated. And uh, so a number of people got infected with this new virus and seven people died. And a new uh, virus called filovirus was, uh, was, uh, uh, was found. And um, then in 1976, as I mentioned, when I was in Sierra Leone, the uh, word came that there was an outbreak of some kind of hemorrhagic fever up in the, uh, the area of, uh, of uh, central Congo. Uh, well, I've already mentioned to you that I spent several years teaching there, and so I was asked to come and help uh, to try to get up in the area to try to help figure out what was going on. This meant not only getting to Kinshasa, and I brought a, a field a, a isolation unit that we could use to work safely or at least semi-safely with, uh, with uh, specimens in the field, and we managed to commandeer uh, an Air Force plane uh, to take us up to uh, this area, and then part of my job was to cover what turned out to be two epidemics, the area between two epidemics, between Nzara, Sudan, and uh, Yambuku in uh, northern uh, uh, Congo. Uh, Ebola is a disease that uh, I think everybody's heard of because it's become very famous um, because of, uh, as much because of the press. Interestingly, there was no press within 5,000 miles of us when we did this initial investigation, and we sort of got a yawn from, uh, from, uh, uh, from the uh, from this, even where well, the CDC was involved, but not a whole lot of other people. Um, but this is a very devastating disease, sudden onset, and uh, depending on which virus infects people, very high mortality, up to uh, 60, 70, 80 percent mortality, also depending on the route of infection. And uh, so we had a team finally that got up to uh, these, this area of, uh, in very, very remote area of northern Congo and up into Nzara to try to understand what was going on. This is the main road between Sudan and uh, Congo, and uh, that's the areas, that's the kind of area that we were working in, and uh, this is uh, trying to piece together all of the information, going through a number of different languages uh, to understand what occurred. And the long story, the short story is that 
This was primarily a, an infection that was brought in by an index case, and we never could figure out exactly who the index case was in, in the Congo, but it was promulgated by poor practices in this little clinic. And uh, this, in what you see in blue in this uh, epidemic curve demonstrates the, um, the epidemic uh, in people who were, went to the hospital, or the clinic rather, and got an injection. And the yellow shows you people who, were, who got an injection but were also in person-to-person -person contact. And the red shows you people who got infected person-to-person -person but had no injections. And you can see the course of the epidemic started predominantly blue and then went to red. Uh, and that's because it started at the hospital and the clinic and then got spread to the various uh, uh, communities. And uh, that caused uh, over 300 cases and an 80% mortality. What we learned out of that was the mortality of those who were exposed by injection was 100%. This set the, the, uh, the pretty much the tone. We've done many investigations since then. We now know that this, not surprisingly, there is asymptomatic, asymptomatic and mild disease. Not everybody dies from this. Um, it's spread by person to person. Uh, we don't know exactly. Now, now we think we know where the source, and the source is probably bats. Uh, certain types of bats uh, that, uh, that live in the area that are, that are uh, endemic to that area. We have no treatment currently for this disease. There is a cell-mediated vaccine. I think the question is we don't know the burden of disease. We have no idea how big the burden of disease. We know that, that uh, Marburg, for example, caused a major outbreak killing uh, hundreds of children in Angola a few years ago. But again, we don't know the, the burden of disease. We know this is a widespread problem in Africa, and uh, so we have much to learn. One, in order to understand the burden of disease, and two, who would we vaccinate? And uh, that is a, as a continuing. Now let me talk about AIDS, because, and I wanna give you the story of the initial investigation in Africa, once again, that I had the, uh, the uh, opportunity to, to uh, be involved with and to lead into Kinshasa uh, in 1983. And once again, uh, I remind you that I started off in the middle of the Congo, but in this case we went to Kinshasa because a colleague from Belgium told me that they had a number of cases of this lymphadenopathy syndrome. So we went in 1983 in September to try to figure out what was going on. And uh, we used the clinical definition that had been developed by that time, but I remind you there was no virus. Um, around, and uh, we went to the Mama Yemo Hospital to look at um, what was uh, going on and uh, found that um, there were 38 cases that fit our AIDS definition. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, cryptococcal meningitis um, in this uh, particular outbreak. Uh, and what we learned was AIDS was widespread in Kinshasa. The sex ratio was one to one very different from what we'd seen. The number of partners highly correlated with AIDS. TB and fungal diseases were common. And we launched the Projet CETA uh, study that was a long-term intervention program. But what was interesting, we got back and reported through the CDC. Uh, Dr. Feige was the uh, director at that time. We reported to the Assistant Secretary of Health, and his first response was, I don't believe it. And for those of you who know the history of AIDS, for how long it took the US government to recognize even the issue here in the United States, um, that was, uh, but to recognize that it was endemic in Africa, that it was heterosexually transmitted, uh, took a very, very long time. So this was a initially not only a neglected disease, but we don't want to hear about it, and we don't believe what you're telling us. Um, we later went to look at the disease in, uh, in the area of the Ebola investigation. And as we suspected, what we found was that in that area, a very remote area where, cultural, uh, um, where the culture was uh, very similar to small town culture in most any parts of the world, over a 10 year period, there was no change in the prevalence of HIV, of, of AIDS. Now in this case, HIV, we actually measured, we were able, by this time we had a virus. So between 1976 and 1986, the prevalence was 0.8%, whereas in other areas, we clearly had demonstrated a lot more disease. So 
this demonstrated how long this disease probably had been circulating in Central Africa, and uh, now we know that in fact Central Africa is likely to be the source of this, and that much of the transmission in the Central African area came probably from the hunting of, of primates, particularly chimpanzees, and the spread to the hunters and then into the communities. The diversity of HIV in this part of the world would certainly argue that this has been going on for quite a while in isolated areas. And probably the West bears an awful lot of responsibility because we're the ones who created the big cities and uh, the commerce that has benefited on the one hand, but also pr uh, provided a complete change in culture as we created these large cities and the opportunity for uh, spread. I'm going to, most of you will know this, so I'm going to skip over this. Hantavirus is another one where we found the virus in our laboratory in 1991 and uh, observed it for the first time. The disease was already known. Um, but today, even today, we don't know the burden of disease, and yet it causes uh, very, very severe illness and death in many parts of the world, including South America. There are a number of outbreaks that have occurred in South America, some in the U.S., as you know, in the, as the Four Corners disease, and it occurs in Africa and uh, throughout much of Asia. But we don't know what the burden of disease is, and there's really not much work going on. Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever, another example of a disease that is widespread uh, throughout, uh, throughout much of Africa and Asia, causes very severe disease with a relatively high mortality of 40%. It occurs in these very remote areas that you see here. And uh, this is an example of two surgeons who became infected and were saved by uh, treatment with ribavirin. Um, in, in, uh, in Pakistan where, while we were working there. And it's again a disease that we know occurs throughout. The, in fact, the virus was originally isolated in Africa, but it, um, we don't know what the burden of disease is, but we know that the, it's the poorest people in these areas, once again, who get infected with this uh, disease. So I will just mention, and Dr. Fisherhawk will talk a little bit more about the relationship between infectious disease and diabetes in South Texas, so I won't uh, dwell on that particular uh, uh, area except to say that we have a whole group working on uh, this with colleagues in Mexico uh, who've been working over it a number of years, but needless to say, diabetes is the highest risk factor for TB in our population. And uh, we are working on a program now nationally, and Dr. fisher will talk more about that, um, to look at what is the threat of diabetes to the TB control program throughout. Now, I, I wouldn't necessarily argue that TB is a neglected disease, but I would argue that it's very underfunded uh, in terms of its size. So finally, what do we have to look forward to? A population that continues to grow one that is becoming more and more urbanized, as you can see here from, uh, from the growth, and particularly urbanized in many of the mega cities that are, that are growing in uh, developing countries, uh, low and middle income countries. A lot of progress has been made in terms of moving people beyond $1 a day. Now, I dare say there aren't many people here who live on, three, on $10 a day, but, but that's beside the point. A lot of progress has been made, yet look at Africa and and not a small part of Latin America where, in fact, people continue to live in what most of us would, continue, would argue to be abject poverty. Even in this area, there still remain an awful lot of people. A dollar a day is a pretty low bar when you think about it for uh, poverty. And uh, the aim by 2015 uh, is to reduce the poverty line to 0.7 billion people. Um, again, that's a relatively low bar, but there is some, uh, some optimism that, in fact, we may get there. Maybe a lot of that will just become uh, from, uh, from inflation, who knows, but uh, it remains the fact that the poorest 20 percent have 2 percent of the world's income. And I don't think that's a very sustainable political, social, or a morally acceptable situation. And. Uh, we continue to live with refugee camps, uh, extreme poverty in many parts of the world, and these are the people, as Dr. Hota has started off with. But what we have to do is provide the opportunity for people like 
in Zongola here to, uh, who went from a village with no electricity and no water and got his degree in physics at Princeton. Um, Mbui here who came from the same background and went to UCLA and got a PhD in biology. Another one of our students who went to, and this is just a group of 13 students in my classes in, in the Congo. My point is this is what global health is about. It's to, it's to provide the opportunity for people like these students to, to be able to fulfill their, their life expectations and those of their own country. And uh, I think that the, the push for global health, um, there are many, many things that are happening now in the push for global health that are incredibly uh, exciting. Meetings like this, the large uh, consortium for universities of global health uh, is very exciting. The U.S. government and the creation of the new global health uh, center at CDC, the uh, expansion of the Fogarty. There are many things that are exciting that, that are helping to, um, to push the agenda of global health. And uh, that's, I think we all, going back to my original comments, we have to continue to push and not be deterred by all of the potential obstacles. Uh, when we do that, I think we will make an impact on all global health, including uh, neglected tropical diseases. And we will provide the opportunity for these two billion people who currently, they will spend much of their life looking for food and shelter will provide them an opportunity for living on more than a dollar a day and fulfilling their own um, uh, life streams and expectations. So I hope that all of you will continue to work with your students, with everybody to push, continue to push hard for um, more involvement in global health, push our governments, other agencies to become involved.